everybody going? Everybody doing good? There we go. Got to hear the peachy, right? Well, welcome, everybody. Hope you're ready to worship. Uh, let's start off with just a, a little chorus of stand. I don't know if you all know this or not, but you can learn it real quick. So, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, glanced by his blood. Joy heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Yes, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join cares with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family. The family of God. Amen. Aren't you glad you're part of that family? Yeah. Amen. Amen. This is what we believe in our church. In this time of desperation. When all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation we believe. Spirit, and He's given us. 
for you. I've got Alan over there, I've got Darren on this side over here. If you take your connection cards, pass them to the outside of the road, they will collect them right now and we appreciate them doing that. So thank you once again for all that. Oh, and I almost forgot this is Nazarene Church and if I, say, if I don't say something about, about our offering box there, I'll be like, hey, you didn't say anything about that. Our offering box is underneath the clock by the double doors. Thank you so much for your giving. We appreciate that. And it is, it is because of your giving we're able to do the things that we do. So just want you to know, that, and that is an act of worship. So thank you for worshiping God with us in the act of giving. We thank you so much. Aren't you glad that God will make a way? Amen. Even when there seems to be no way. Amen. Ever been there? Maybe you're there right now. Amen. Yeah, some of us are there right now. But we believe God will make a way. If you're able, stand. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to continue to worship God through song. Father God, we thank you so much. That God, that, that you make a way even when we see there's no way. But God, you make a way. We just want to praise you for that right now, Lord. Thank you for walking in the room for your presence here with us, God. And Lord, we do love you and we worship you, Father. And we are believing and trusting in that way that you're going to make for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Be my guide, hold me close. 
closely to his side with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way with love and strength for each new day he will make a
of God. Yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. God's good, right? All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Um, this last song, um, I'll be honest, I put these songs together in like 10 seconds last night because I already had some of them in mind. Um, it, we were at the board meeting and, and God, I, I'm sitting there and the way they're talking, talking about family and our church is a family and you know that's the way it's supposed to be, it's the way it should be, it's the way God wants it, it's the way Christ came to give it, to make it a family, and make it close. And, <clears throat> excuse me, but you know, this morning I got up early, and I'm sitting there, looking at these songs, and I go, listen to them, I, I go through them all just in my head, and I'm sitting in, and just listen to them, and uh, it's, the songs just, I mean, a couple of them I, I picked out today, but they came to me just like that, and it's, it, I think God's awesome the way he sets his service up, it's not me. It's God's service. This is what He wants. That's yeah. why I pray every time I pick these songs. I say, God, pick out the songs you want to have people praise you for it and have people understand and see what you're about. Amen? Amen. This last song, um, let's welcome the Holy Spirit into our service today. <laughs> Your presence, Lord. 
your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness.
in our spiritual battle? Who would like to have help in your spiritual battle? All right, that should be 100%, right? We all need that help. And can I tell you something right off the bat? We face an enemy, duh, right? We, we call him the devil, Satan. Same thing, same person, bad guy. God, good guy. Devil, bad guy, right? And, and, and we know that the, the devil is powerful, isn't he? But is, is he as powerful as God? And who's on our side as believers? God is on our side. So if God is on our side and he is more powerful than the one that we are fighting, that should make me more powerful than my enemy because Jesus is in me. If I grab what I have available to me, we need to understand a few things. We're going to look at some biblical truths today. We'll look at some biblical truths that we can apply to our life. First of all, we're going to talk about the enemy, who he is, what he is, where he's from. And then we're going to look at the equipment, the tools, the weapons that we have in our spiritual battle. And I want to read <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 to begin with. This is Paul's writing. He says, finally, so in other words, Paul says, I've said all of this to say this right here. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I'm glad Paul wrote that and didn't say, finally, y'all, be strong in yourself and in your own mighty power. He, he didn't write that, did he? Because he knows that we can't defeat the enemy on our own. So Paul says we need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He says put on the full, say full. full. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Unless we know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he can do, we will have a difficult time defeating the enemy. Any military man worth their salt will say, the commander will say, I want to learn everything I can about my enemy so I will be better prepared for the battle, for the war. So we, we, we know this, so we have to ask ourselves, well, where did the devil come from? Well, most scholars believe, and I believe with them, that the devil, Satan, his, he was Lucifer. He was an angel in heaven. As a matter of fact, most believe that he was the top-ranking angel in heaven. And he would look at God's throne because there's God, and, and Lucifer uh, was right underneath God in his power, and his authority. And he kept eyeing that throne of God. And he said, boy, I would like to sit on that throne. Well, God's the only one that can fit on the throne. God's the only one that can sit on the throne. God is the supreme. So, so God said, nope, not happening. So he threw and kicked the devil, Lucifer, out of heaven and flung him through the earth. And now here we are with him. So, so we know that he was the high-ranking angel in heaven. And did you know that one of his duties, one of the, the devil's duties in heaven was that he was in charge of the choirs. He was in charge of music in heaven. And boy, does that make sense when we listen to our music today. <laughs> right? Because you cannot convince me that the devil, he knows what he's doing when it comes to music. And he uses music today to try to move people away from God as far as he can. So let me tell you this. Be careful Understand what the music you're listening to says and understand the words that they're saying to your children before you let them listen to certain types of music. Now, we do know this. We know the devil was a created being. God created all the angels. So if, since he was created, guess what? He is limited in his power. Did you know this about the devil? Did you know the, that the devil is not all-knowing? God is all known. The devil is. Did you know that? Or did you know that, that the devil, he is limited in his knowledge and in, in his activity? The devil is not all powerful. God is. The, the devil is not everywhere present. God is. So we need to understand that, yes, the devil is powerful, but sometimes I think we give the devil too much credit. We need to understand that he is not even in the same class as God. 
Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage you, do not give the devil too much credit. Yes, he's powerful, but with Jesus, I can defeat him. Not me, Jesus in me. Amen, church? <laughs> so don't say the devil made me do it. We say that sometimes to try to get out of trouble. And I understand and I get it. But really, did you really know the devil can't make you do anything? Did you know that? He puts these opportunities, he puts these decisions in front of you, and you are the one who makes the decision. There's a spiritual battle going on in this world right now. Do you realize that? There's a spiritual battle, and you and I are in this battle. It's not against human beings, Paul tells us. It's against the devil. So I, I think what Paul is telling the believers in Ephesus is, and therefore through the word of God, he tells you and I today. <coughs> Don't fight amongst each other. There's something behind this person that you need to be fighting with. Don't waste your time with fighting with each other. Let's spend our energy and our efforts on the one in the spiritual realm who's fighting against all of us. Does that make sense, church? Amen. A couple of you are like, oh, man, but I like that. I, I, I like taking that one and just getting them in a the headlock and just, just pounding them like this. I enjoy that, Pastor Doug. Yeah, you probably do, and I get it. I understand it. I used to enjoy that too. But we've got an enemy who is above people here. What I mean by that is the spiritual enemy, the devil. I want to focus on him and make sure he doesn't get to me, doesn't get to my family, doesn't get to my children, doesn't get to my grandchildren. I've got to keep him away from them. That's more important to me than getting this person who deserves a, a kick in the stomach when they're down. I don't know if I'd get any amens on that or not, so that's okay. <laughs> and Jesus, he tells us who the devil is in himself. And this very popular uh, uh, verse, because I've said it a lot, John 10.10, 10, Jesus talks about the devil. Jesus says the devil comes only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's the devil's Number one goal is to kill and steal and destroy you and your family and the church. That's the only purpose the devil has. He could not take God's throne, so he's going to do his best to take away all of God's people in any way he can. But we cannot read the beginning of this verse without ending the verse. I love what it says here. Jesus says, I, Jesus, have come that they, Jesus followers, Jesus believers, that they may have life and have a what? To the full. What does that mean? That means that Jesus has victory for you even on this side of heaven. Amen. Amen? Amen. You all catching on. That's good. <laughs> because I need victory. You need victory? Amen. I get my victory when I'm in Jesus. Jesus has defeated the devil already. Did you know that Satan, the devil, masquerades as an angel of light? He puts his costume on and he pretends to be something good. First Corinthians says this, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Once again, the devil does anything he can to try to blind your mind to the truth in God's word. We are in a hand-to-hand -hand battle. Satan wants to use the world around us. He wants to use the flesh in us. What is the flesh? The flesh is me, me, me. I want to do this. I want to beat up my neighbor. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do that. That's the flesh. That, that's the me, me, me. Jesus says, more of me, Jesus, and less of you. But the devil, he, he wants to use the devil. He wants to use the world. He wants to use the flesh. He wants to use the enemy. He wants to use everything he can to defeat you. So thank you so much for the pick-me-up, right? Can anybody say thanks for the pick-me-up, Pastor Doug? You know, there's a spiritual battle out there, isn't there? There is a spiritual battle that we face every day. And that voice inside of you that tells you to do something from time to time, and you know it's not going to end up good, I can promise you this, it's not coming from Jesus. It's coming from the enemy. So since I've given you this, this pick-me-up, we're all excited now that, that we have this enemy and, and he's trying to, to de defeat us every single day. I'm going to tell you how we can defeat him because we have got certain equipment. We've got some tools. We've got some weapons that we could use in battle. 
Because I do not want to go to war looking like this with no protection, no weapon. Do you? I want to have protection, right? <coughs> well, I'm excited about it anyway. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to read this part here because this talks about the full armor of God. Verses 13 through 17. It says this. Therefore, put on the full. He says it again. That's the second time Paul has said that. Therefore, put on the full. Say full. Full armor of God. That means every single piece. That means don't leave anything off. Paul is saying y'all need all of it. He says so that when the day of evil comes. Paul did not say so that when the day of evil. Because it might come. It may come. It, it possibly come. The day of evil will come. The enemy is going to come after you. We all know that because we live more than. Well our youngest one is six days old. But we've, we've lived long enough. We understand that the enemy comes after us. Doesn't he? It says. We need to put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, when the battle is over, you will still be standing. He says this is how you can do it. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, he says, you've got to have that, but you also need this. He says, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. He's not just going to throw arrows at you. They're going to be on fire. Ever feel like your life is on fire? Paul says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Since we are fighting against the enemy in the spiritual battle that we are in, we need special equipment to fight this battle. And God gives us that equipment. And we are so excited about that. And once again, Paul says, we need every single piece. Why? Because the devil is looking for that one place in your life that's unguarded. The scripture says he wants to get a foothold. He just wants to get his toe in there. He just wants to get a piece in there. So he's looking at your life and, and seeing, do you have the full armor of God? Or maybe there's one piece that you're missing. That's where he's going to attack every single time. So let's look at what this armor of God can do. Okay? First of all, we want to look at the belt of truth. Once again, we know that the devil is a liar. There's no truth in the, in the devil. We get that. This is red letter, John 8, 44. This is Jesus speaking again. Jesus says he, and he's talking about the devil here. He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. He says, when he lies, when the devil lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and a father of all lies. There is no truth in our enemies. None. Zero. Nada. The operator's phone number. Zero truth in the enemy. And he will not tell you anything that's true at all. He will give you lies to try to deceive you. As Jesus followers, our lives are controlled by the truth, or they should be. So then i got to ask myself, well, what is the truth? Well, this is answered right here in John 14, 16. Jesus answered. This is Jesus says, I, Jesus, am the way and the truth and the life. So we see that Jesus is the truth. And if, I'm the, and if I am a Jesus follower, I have Jesus in me then that means that the truth, Jesus, will control my life because I allow him to move me however he needs. And guess what? I will have victory over the devil only when I have Jesus in my life. Amen. And Jesus is the truth. The devil is anything but. Truth is always more powerful than lies. Let's look at the next piece of armor. The breastplate of righteousness. This is a piece of armor made of metal. Often, you know, maybe you'll see some chains on there once in a while. Like that. It, it protects and it covers the body from neck to waist, front and back. And what this, when we look at the spiritual aspect of this, it is symbolizing the righteousness that we have in Christ. Paul, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians and he said this to them. He said, God made him, God made Jesus who had no sin because we know Jesus lived a perfect life. Right, church? Amen. Jesus had no sin in his life. The only one to ever walk this earth and never sin was Jesus himself. 
So God made him, when he's talking about Jesus here, who had no sin, to be sin for us. You realize that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was on the cross. And then, and then you remember that scene in the Bible where, where Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said those words because in that moment, all of the sin of the world, past, present, and future, was placed on God's only son, Jesus. There was so much sin on Jesus that God, for that moment, literally turned away. And Jesus, who has such a close relationship with the Father, knew that he has shifted his focus for just that moment. Why aren't you glad the story doesn't stop there? Because we know that, that, that Jesus, they buried him. Three days later, he came up out of the grave. Amen, church? Amen. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And we can have that as well. And let me tell you something. When the devil attacks you, and he will, especially if you're a Jesus follower and you ask Jesus into your life and you say, God, forgive me my sins, and he does that, and you're like, woo It's either from the, from the time you say that until probably a short time afterwards, the devil's going to come to you, and he's going to say this. He's going to say, did God really save you? Are you sure that God saved you? Because you've done a lot of bad things. It is in those moments that you can see, that you can see this verse right here. And you can say, you know what? Jesus died for my sins. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He defeated the devil. So that I could become the righteousness of God. That means that I am a child of God. That means I am a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I belong to God and devil. I will not listen to you today. And you can punt him right out the front door. Amen, church? Amen. So when the devil attacks you and tells you that God does not care about you, you can say, hey, I'm the righteousness of God. I'm a child of God. I belong to him. Devil, not today. See you later. Get out of here. Can I get amen? Amen. Let's look at the shoes of the gospel. The Roman soldier, they would have shoes on, whether they were, were, were boots or sandals or whatever they wear. They had what they called hobnails or little spikes in the bottom of them. And what that would do is that would give them traction for when they fight against the enemy. When that battle's coming, they've got to have good traction. What does that mean to me and you? That means that if we are going to stand in this spiritual battle, I must have those shoes of the gospel with them spikes in the bottom of my shoe. Why? Because I need to be planted Firmly in my faith. We must be planted firmly in your faith. And if I have the gospel, guess what I have? I've got peace in my life. Who needs peace? Oh, we need peace, don't we? Let's see what Romans 5 1 says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, what's that big word justified mean? Here's what that word means. It means that I've asked Jesus into my heart, and I've said, God, please forgive me my sins. And he's able to do that because I believe that he is who he says he is, the Son of God. And that he can do what he says he will do, and that is forgive me my sins. He can take my sins, he can, he can roll them up, and he can throw them way over there and never bring it up again. That means I'm justified. That's just a big word for being saved is another church word, or, or I just become the Jesus follower. Just saying, Jesus, forgive me. That's what justified me. And we do that through faith because we believe that he is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. When we've done that, Paul says in Romans that we have peace. There we go again. We have that peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Let me tell you something. I must be have peace with God. In other words, I am a friend of God. We sing that song sometimes, don't we? I am a friend of God. We must have peace with God. We must have a relationship with God. If I'm going to defeat the enemy, if I'm going to defeat the devil, I must have peace with God in my life. My relationship with Jesus must be exactly what it can be. And then him, through me, can defeat the enemy. And I love the, when we talk about the shoes, there's another meaning in that as well. It means that we need to be prepared as we walk about in our life to share gospel of peace, which is Jesus to those around us. It, it means that, that, that I tell others what Jesus has done for me in my life, and what he can do for you in your life. That's what it means. And can I let you in on a little secret? I have found this to be true. 
I have seen it to be true. I have lived it to be true. The most victorious Christian, the one who has the victory in their lives, is the one who's going around telling others about Jesus. Did you get that? Maybe I need to say that again. The, the Christian who is witnessing about Jesus, and witnessing is just that. You are telling others what you witnessed, what Jesus has done for you. Those are the ones who have victory in their life. Amen. So do not be afraid to share Jesus with others. You want victory in your life? Share Jesus with others. I don't feel like a pastor does. Hey, guess what? Sometimes I don't feel like it too. But Jesus has done so much for me, I have to do it. If I want victory, I must do it. Are, 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 are you getting, are you picking up what I'm laying down here, church? We need to be out there telling others about Jesus. And in that, we will have peace with God. And in that, we will have victory over the enemy. Can I get amen? Amen. All right, move on, Pastor Doug. I will. Shield of faith. I love the shield of faith. This shield, it was a large shield. And there was, there was something that was pretty cool about this shield. It was usually made of wood, and they would put this tough leather on it a lot of times. And, and the soldier, of course, you want to hold that shield in front of you, aren't you? Because you want to knock down the arrows and the spears or whatever the, the enemy is throwing at you. You've got, you got to knock that down. Here's a, that's something I really love about the Roman, the Roman shields. Is the edges of them were made in such a way that they could, that they could interlock with each other. And so when they were in battle, they could all line up and they could lock their shields together. And now, facing the enemy, they're moving nice and slow and in concert, and they're moving toward the enemy, and they look like a solid wall. You know, you know what that tells me? You are not alone in your battle. Let me ask you this question. Because this, well, that's one of the biggest lies of the devil. He will tell you that you are all alone. He will tell you that no one else cares. He will tell you that you are on a desert island all by yourself. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah, we have, haven't we? Because the enemy keeps telling us that. But here's what that shield of faith means. It means when you are in that battle, you say, Pastor Doug, I'm in a battle. I said, hang on a minute. Let me lock my shield in with yours. And that person sitting next to you, they're going to lock their shields into ours as well. And the one in front of you and behind you, we're all going to lock shields together and we're going to move toward that enemy and the enemy has no chance against all of us because you are not alone. We say here at Waynesburg, we do life together. So when you are going through that battle, when you're in that moment where you're like, I cannot stand by myself, or maybe you can't. Call someone. Get a hold of someone. Me, someone, a dear friend that, that's sitting next to you and say, hey, I need your shield of faith to lock in with mine. Because I need some help in this battle. And we can all battle together. Now, I'm going to give you some good news. We never know when the devil, when the enemy is going to fling the flaming arrows at us. That's really not good news. but Because we don't know when he's going to do that, do we? So what does that mean? I must always carry my shield of faith because I don't know when they're coming or where they're coming from. I've got to have that ready. I've got to have the full armor at all times. I've got to have that shield held high. How do I do that? I can tell you how to keep your faith high. You continue praising Jesus. You worship Him every single day. You get into the Word of God. You study it. You learn who God is. You pray, which is just no fancy word for talk. You talk with God throughout the day. You keep all that in your forefront, in, in, in the top of your mind, the top of your head right there. You do all that every day. That helps keep our shield up high. Because once again, the devil wants to keep you so busy that you forget some of those things. He wants to keep you so busy that, that at night you get ready to lay your head down after you've done running the kids all over the place. And, 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 and you change that last dirty diaper for the day or whatever it may be. And, and, and you're just like, I am wore out. And you're like, oh, I forgot to read my Bible. I'll, I'll, I'll get it tomorrow. Boom. The devil wants to keep you so busy, you forget all these things. You forget to worship God every single day. You forget to tell him, God, you are amazing. You are awesome. I love you. Thank you for who you are in my life. That keeps the sword of the Spirit high. The shield of faith, I mean, high. 
I got ahead of myself there, didn't I? Aren't you glad that your pastor is not perfect? Because I'm not far from it. I looked down and saw the sword of the Spirit, and then I said that instead of saying it. Hey, let's go to the next one. The helmet of salvation. What is the helmet of salvation? It's a helmet. What does a helmet do? It protects your head. Okay, what, the, what this means is, is it is protecting our mind. Because once again, Satan wants to attack your mind. He wants to get you to, to, to think of things and to, and to move you away from the things you should do. Amen? And guess what? If God controls my mind, I have that helmet of protection around me. And that allows me to not let the devil leave, lead me astray. Because the devil wants to lead you astray. So I must have that helmet of salvation. I must allow God to control my thoughts and my minds and my attitudes. Now that's where I've got to say, I really want to, I really want to punch that person, but maybe I better not because I want that helmet of salvation on my life. Let's look at the sword of the spirit. The last one here that Paul talks about. The sword of the Spirit, it's our only offensive weapon. Do you realize that? In all the gear that that Roman soldier had, the, the, the sword is their only offensive weapon. Everything else is protection. The sword, which is the Word of God, I can go and I, I, I can take that sword and I can cut my enemies up. And the Roman soldiers, what they would do, they had, they had a short sword that they would put in their belt. And it was they would pull it out when they had that close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it was double-edged. You know what you know what double-edged sword is, right? It's sharp on both edges. Like a steak knife is only sharp on one side. The double-edged sword, sword is sharp on both sides. That way the soldier, he can cut you this way and this way both. Everything is efficient, man. It cuts your enemy right out. Did you know that the Word of God, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, says this? For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Well, how can the word of God be sharper than a double-edged sword? Here, how, here, how, here is how it can be. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Mm -hmm. That's sharp. Can I tell you this? God's word is offensive. It's offensive. Why? Because it cuts them deep. Because it tells them, and the Spirit of God tells them, what you are doing is not right. You need Jesus in your life. People don't like that, do they? That's how sharp the Word of God is. It, it can get to our heart. It penetrates us. It makes us realize, I need Jesus. That's the sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit, once again, it's, it's the Word of God. And if we look a little bit closer, well, what, what is the Word of God? Yes, it's the Bible, but it's much more than that. John 1, 14 says, the Word, and the capital W means this is talking about Jesus here. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus became the Word of God and came down and lived His life right here in front of us. When we look at the whole armor of God, did you realize that it's really, it, it's, it's a picture of Jesus? you realize that? I mean, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is our righteousness. He's our peace for sure, isn't he? Jesus makes our faith possible. Jesus is our salvation. And Jesus is the word of God. He's the one that can penetrate our heart and our soul. So I've said all of that to say this. How about you today? Do you have the full armor of God in your life? You know, the first step in receiving the armor of God is to receive Jesus into your heart and life. Now, I can't tell you about the armor of God without giving you an opportunity to receive the one who can give that to you. That's Jesus, the Son of God. The one who came down on earth, lived his life in front of us, gave his life on the cross, conquered death, conquered the grave, so you and I can have eternal life to an end. It's really easy to do. And you can do that right here and right now, and I'm going to show you how. We do this from time to time here. 
I want, I want to do it again today. I want everyone to just kind of close your eyes and bow your heads, if you will. And we're, we're going to say just a few words here. And, and I'm just going to ask you today if you would repeat these words after me. And I want everyone to repeat these words because it may be encouraging those sitting next to you to say it for the first time. And I must say this as I always do. These words themselves will not save you. It's the faith and the sincerity that you have in your heart and life that can save you. So if you want that armor of God, the first step is to allow God to be in your life. So I just want everyone together to say this, and if you mean this, and if you are sincere, this short prayer that we'll say, Jesus is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. He is the Son of God, and he can forgive you of your sins. So if everyone, let's just say this together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I confess that I am a sinner, and in need of your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And rose again. I repent of my sins. And turn to you. Please come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And guide me from this day forward. Thank you for your love and grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now just go ahead and keep your eyes closed and head down for just a moment. Because I want to ask you this, and I won't call you out and tell you I don't do that. But I just want to ask you today, if someone here asked Jesus into your heart and into your life today, would you just signify that by raising your hand real quick just so I can see that? Amen. I see that. Amen. <coughs> Thank you so much for doing Everyone can look up here at me now. I'm going to ask you one more question. If you're brave enough, I'm not going to call you out. Because the Bible says this. The Bible says that uh, when you accept Jesus, that we should tell someone. Because the devil's going to come right away and start beating you down. And the easiest place to tell others is right here with other believers. So I'm going to ask, and you don't have to, and I'm not going to call you out. But if you're brave enough... To say, I asked Jesus into my life today. Would you just so we can all celebrate? Would you just raise your hand? Anybody brave enough to say that? Amen. Look around, church. Look around, church. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate that together. Hey, that's what we're here for. Amen, church. Amen. So here's what I want you to do. When you leave today, we're all gonna go this way. Those who can stay, because we want you to stay for dinner. I'm I'm picking up the tab. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone who brought food. It's amazing. You do an amazing job. Because we want to get to know each other better. But here's what I want you to do. If, if you gave your heart and life to Jesus, I want you to, to kind of gather right here because I, I just want to, to, to pray with you for a moment. And then I've, I've got something I will get in my office for you during, the, during the, the meal as well that will help you out. Amen, church? Amen. So here's what I want you to do. Go and be Jesus to someone this week. Amen? Amen. Remember, we're going to have the shoes of the gospel of peace. Tell others what that peace has meant for you in your life. Church, we love you. Walk out this way and have dinner with us. If you just gave your life to Jesus, I want to meet you right down here for just a few moments. God bless you, church. You are dismissed.